you could, I think you st stay with me until the end. You could really almost predict, based on the people who run for presidency, who's going to be a president. For example, uh, if you think that uh, our current president was just a fluke, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. It's, he's a part of a process. I'll give you an example. For the past 50 years or so, the American people had developed a very strong uh, feeling of untrust in what they call Washington. So, especially after the Vietnam War and so on and so forth, you know, the Nixon ordeal, you'll see that they always try to pick up a person that seems to the American people as an outsider. Whether it's Jimmy Carter, he looked like an outsider. You know, he was a peanut farmer from Georgia, and he probably should have stayed there. I think the biggest two so-called outsiders that actually were able to cause a major change in Washington was were uh, Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton. George Bush, the father, was not so much of an outsider, but that's what it seems like. Washington needs to be fixed. So you see, after Ronald Reagan, the big outsider came in, they took somebody from the establishment hoping that he would follow. Of course, it didn't, and so on and so forth. So therefore, the more frustrated, by the way, we come from with Washington, the more radical of a person we picked. Take, for example, Obama. Take Trump. It's a swing. So if we're going to be, let's say right now, at 2020, and we probably don't see even 25, we just see 2020, hopefully, based on the candidates that would run, most likely the bigger outsider has a greater chance to win. That's why Bernie was such a big thing, and that's why Hillary was not voted in. Regardless of Russia, Cahoots, Macahoots, it's all baloney. So I understand, there's a certain pattern here. Hillary represented the good old Washington that everybody hates. Bernie had a better, a better chance to win than her because he was a bigger outsider than Trump. They're probably going to go 50-50. So that's what it is. And as you can see, you know, because they come into Washington and they don't fix the system. They don't fix the system. And then we need somebody we feel more radical from the outside to come in. So I hate to think who would, what would be the case in 2020. But the problem is that Washington does not understand that. Of course, people from the outside cannot really inflict a positive change since they don't really understand the system. You need somebody who is brave enough to understand the system and fix it from within because they simply get overwhelmed by the system then they become a part of this so-called big matrix. So what does it have to do with us? In terms of, in terms of Yiddishkeit, in terms of Yahadut, people live, people live uh, Judaism. You see that? Uh, excuse me, no, not there. Huh? Don't touch that. Not there. Yeah. No, that uh, curtain. Yeah, in Panama. In Panama. Okay. People feel very frustrated with the, with the Judaism. And that should be a wake-up call for the rabbis, for leaders, because Judaism goes through certain transformation every now and then, every few hundred years, goes through certain transformation. And in this transformation, people leave the faith. Always. They get so-called tired of the old regime that seems like it's not fixing things up with the way things go. Whether it was reform, or conservatism, or chassidut, or shabtaut, or whatever you have it, or secularism as it is today. We need to understand that with all the kiruv 
efforts that you're going to put in, with all the money and effort that you waste and you spend, you're not going to be effective because the people are going to be out again. Once they come into the system, I speak to many Baalei Tshuva, that really became Baalei Tshuva out of uh, truthfulness of the heart. Then they get very frustrated with the division, with the rejection that they feel from the from people. They never are accepted as equal parts. They always Baalei Tshuva, they're different. Because I don't think, regardless of how strong of a Baal Tshuva you are, and how sincere you are as a Baal Tshuva, you could become a, a gadol that learned the whole shas and poskim and so on and so forth. I don't think that anyone in the right mind, unfortunately, would give, of course, if he's a, let's say, a Rosh Yeshiva or a Chashuva Rabbi or somebody like this, will give his daughter to a person like that, just because he's a Baal Tshuva. So people like this get frustrated. And eventually they go out. People from within go out. We need to see exactly what is that we are doing that makes people not only come in to, to Frumkai, to keeping Torah and mitzvot. What is it that we are doing wrong that we can hold our people in? And the more we continue with this and putting the blame on something else, on someone else, and not looking at what we are doing, the more radical that process will be and the further the people would go, just like in politics. That's why I am telling you it is a pattern that you need to look at. Not an individual, oh, that's politics, that's different, that's Judaism. different. No, you need to look at the politics. There is a certain level of frustration from people within. We always try to quiet it down with certain submission to the gdolim and so on and so forth. And you can't ask and you can't question, but not, not today. People want answers. And you should be able to give them answers. And you should not hide behind your... Yo, you know, fedoras and and, Bors, and, and and Borsolinos and Hamburgs. You should be able to give answers. And we don't give answers. And the frustration grows. And then you have kids who go on drugs. From kids. You have Hasidish kids who smoke pot and ecstasy and all kind of stuff like this. Why is that? Why don't we look at what we do and our responsibility? Is it because we always want the quantity and not the quality? Are we giving mass-produced uh, uh, agendas to people rather than individualized attention and agendas? Why do we have to have agendas altogether? Are we doing this for whom? For ourselves? Or are we doing this for God? I spoke to you last week about the difference in Avraham Avinu when he made people, people made a bracha, Birkat Amazon, after he ate. After they ate, not before they ate. If Avraham Avinu could have said, guys, you know, come to my tent. You want to eat something? You died? You, you thirsty? Good. You can't have anything until you make a bracha. Everybody will make a bracha. Avraham Avinu did not do that. After they ate, after they were full. Then they were able to say bracha. So of course, he lost a lot of people. He could have made more souls. But Avraham Avinu realized that it's the quantity that everybody runs after, not the quality. And he therefore did it different. He was looking for the quality of the bracha. As I keep saying to you all the time, when you eat and you make a bracha, do you eat just so you can make a bracha, or you'll make a bracha just so you can eat. What's more important here? The fact that I can make a bracha to Hashem, and therefore I would look for every opportunity to do that, 
Or I see the bracha as a mere obstacle that stands in my way to fulfill my physical desires. If I could, I probably won't. And that's something we need to look into in the way we mechanech our people, our children. Maybe our yeshivot are too big. Maybe we should go to a format of smaller yeshivot. Maybe that's the reason why there's so there's such a lack of gdolim in our time. You know, one god will die. We already nominate the other one as a god, regardless of how big or small he is. But the magnitude of people is not there anymore. We have Chad Bedara, one in a generation. We have Rav Avadiyah Yosef, we have Rav Belsky, Chad Bedara. We don't have masses of people who are great. Maybe that's the difference between mass produce anything to specially handcrafted. Something that could become a family heirloom that you can hand it from generation to generation. I don't think everybody will be able to hand down his grandson his Casio watch that he bought in the 70s. Those things don't work. I have my grandfather's watch. It's a Omega watch from 1950. Still works. Just wind it and it works. I'm probably going to be able to give it to my grandson. And he's probably going to be able to give it to his grandson. Is our Torah going to last the test of time when we are trying to mass produce it? If I have a yeshiva with 2,000 guys inside of it, and 2,000 guys want to talk to me for five minutes a day, I don't have enough days in my life to fulfill that. And what's five minutes to guide somebody? However, if you have 20 guys, you can give an hour to a guy a day. That will fill up a whole entire day. You guide a person, he's in need. Even a tree, even a plant needs caring and nourishment and attention. Do we give this attention to our kids? Do we give this attention to our people? Or we just set them free? Is it we do it for ourselves? Do we understand what is happening? Even when we're doing such a wonderful job as Kiruv, who exactly are we doing this for? Truthfully, you don't have to answer me. Answer yourself. Who exactly are you doing this for? You're doing this for yourself? Or you're doing this for Kadosh Baruch Are you doing so as an opportunity for you to become a big macher in the Kiruv world? So people would say, oh, he's a big guy? Or you do your your matan ba, ba, matan tzedakah baseter. Nobody knows. You want to have a plaque and a shul with your name on it, donated, or you want to give without nobody knowing, and then continuously giving. Matan baseter is a great level of tzedakah. The way you don't know who you give it to. And the person receiving doesn't know who gave it to him. We should start at that. Of course, the highest form of tzedakah is when you give a person a job. Why? So he can have dignity. So when you do kiruv, don't just bring him aboard to have more masses. Give the people dignity. Stop calling them balet tshuva. Start treating them as just like another person, as probably a better person than you are. If God forgives them, if God embraces them, so can you. If you are not willing and able to do so, don't bring them on board to push them back. Shabbat Shalom.